Well, our attention turns this morning in the second of four messages to be given on the subject of worship and church attendance. From the purpose of worship, which is gathering to give God glory and gathering to give our brothers and sisters the encouragement that they need, we move from the purpose of worship to the priority of worship. A priority is a thing regarded as more important than another. Worship, sacred as it is, was never meant to be just one more thing in a long list of things to do. In the life of the Christian, worshiping with the church is to be a priority. It is a privilege and a duty to be held in esteem and practice above the many things that clamor for our time and our attention. And yet, as the statistics that I shared with you last week indicate, it clearly, worship clearly is not a priority for many. A recent article from the Gospel Coalition observed that the average committed evangelical attends church twice a month. This is the type of statistic that caused one writer to conclude that we in the church work at our play and play at our worship. Now, maybe that doesn't apply to you this morning, and I hope it doesn't. Many of you do work at your worship, and you are here week after week, and so you might think right out of the gate that this message I'm about to give has nothing to do with you, that it doesn't concern you, but it concerns the church. And if it concerns the church, then prayerfully it concerns you. And more than that, this half to less than half the time attendance is not just the trend in some faraway churches. It's right here in the churches in our own town. It is right here in our own church. Now, if you are here today and you are admittedly confessing I am not a regular church attender, I just want to forewarn you, you might feel like you're getting picked on, but it is not my desire uh, in any way to pick on anybody. My desire today is to set forth the truth of God and let the Holy Spirit do what he will. Now, yeah, we're going to go to those slides. We're not going to go to those slides. We are going to go. Would you check the airflow? <laughs> Clearly the problem is with that projector. This looks a lot better. This is heart trouble, I don't know. 
We'll get into that in a second. Okay, so same thing. I over here. In the uh, in worship attendance in general, so it's not, we're not just talking about stuff that's happening in faraway churches. We're talking about what's happening right here in Ellsworth, Maine. You can get rid of those now, thank you. The folks have seen the bad news. That's just what it is. That's that's data. You do with it what you want. We know that in any church there are going to be fluctuations in attendance. That's not a problem. But that graph is indicative, as I told you, of what's happening across the country. It's not just that a couple of people went on vacation or some people were not feeling well. When you have shifts of 20, 30, 40, 50 people from Sunday to Sunday right here, and then I go and I talk to a colleague down the road, and I say, how's worship going for you? And he goes, worship is going good, but it's the funniest thing. We may have 65. We may have 105. We're all seeing this up and down kind of trend. Okay, it represents what the church in America today is lamenting, that even among the people who consider themselves committed Christians, many are not weekly, uh, gathering weekly with any consistency. Okay? Our subject this morning is the priority of worship. The title of this morning's message is Every Sunday? As in, do I have to go every Sunday? And the answer is yes. If you are able, yes, because believers belong in worship every week. Pray. Lord, of a sense, this could be a challenging one to us, and I pray that we would be really receptive to understanding this morning what is at stake. And Lord, what is most important? Because you are faithful, you will show us that and you will teach us. So God, we sit at your feet. We open our ears. We are ready to hear and learn from you. In name we pray and ask. Amen. Where does this concept of, and where does this expectation of weekly worship come from? We're going to take some time this morning to see how the pattern of weekly worship develops in Scripture. We're going to sort of begin in the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, if you're turning around in your copy of God's Word, Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to read to you verses 1 to 3, maybe verses 2 and 3. Yeah. On the seventh day, God finished His work. What we have here is God finishing up creation, okay? story of creation in Genesis. On the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. We have here God instituting what would become known as the Sabbath. That is a word that means intermission, from a word that means to repose or to desist from exertion. God himself, the Bible tells us here in Genesis, rested on the seventh day. Now, was he tired, do you think? No, it's not possible for God to be tired. He who keeps Israel does not slumber, does not sleep. God set aside one day of the week as holy in order to give us an example. To establish a rhythm of work and rest. Six days to work, one day. One day a week to stop working, to rest, to step back, to observe, and to enjoy. In the book of Exodus, God provides more details about the specifics of how this Sabbath should be kept. We find that in Exodus chapter 20. 
And if that sounds familiar to you, I think it should because that's where we find the Ten Commandments. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So in this passage we find guidelines about how to keep a day holy, what it means to keep the Sabbath. But we don't see yet any mention of gathering for worship on that day of the week until we come to the book of Leviticus, which if you look in Leviticus, chapter 23 and verse 3, it says this, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So this is the first mention of convocation. It's a, a word in Hebrew that means something called out, a public meeting, an assembly. The people are called by God here on this day to do holy things, to do holy exercises, to pray, to praise, to hear the word of God, and to sacrifice. And thus the weekly Sabbath observance began to include the element of gathering for corporate worship. Now we fast forward and we take a look into the life of Jesus, we see that it is still the case. Sabbath observance includes corporate worship, like going to the synagogue. Mark 121, and they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and was teaching. Mark 6, 2, and on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Luke 4, 16, and he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Luke 6, 6, on another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there with a right hand that was withered. Now, these are not all the examples. I'm just giving you a taste, an idea that Jesus went to synagogue. Synagogue uh, means assemblage of persons. It means a meeting place. It is akin to our term church. And we repeatedly, in the accounts of the New Testament, see Jesus going to the synagogue on the Sabbath. As we just read in Luke 4.16, it was his custom. It was Jesus' habit to go to church or to go to synagogue on the Sabbath. So to summarize this, from the beginning, God has set apart a day, a day of the week to be holy. It was to be a day of reflection and a day of, of, of rest. Listen to how John Piper envisions God's perspective on this particular day. This is how Piper envisions the Sabbath, what God would say about it. Let my highest creature, the one in my image, stop every seven days and commemorate with me the fact that I am the creator who has done all this. Let him stop working and focus on me, that I am the source of all that he has. I am the fountain of blessing. I have made the very hands and mind with which he works. Let one day out of seven demonstrate that all land and all animals and all raw materials and all breath and strength and thought and emotion and everything come from me. Let man look to me in leisure one day out of seven for the blessing that is so elusive in the affairs of this world. This holy day became a convocation, a day of convocation for the people of God to assemble. Eventually, the Sabbath was celebrated in part in the synagogues as the people of God gathered weekly in worship. It was Jesus' custom. It was the disciples as well to go to synagogue. Now, we should note the pattern of weekly worship did not uh, stop after Jesus' death and resurrection. The disciples did not say, well, Jesus is gone. We don't have to go to church. That's not how that happened. In the book of Acts, especially, we see that Jesus' disciples went to the synagogues to worship, and they went there to teach. The first Christians worshipped initially on that seventh-day Sabbath, on Saturday. But as you might imagine, it wasn't too long before 
The Christians were not welcome in the Jewish synagogues. The worship was a bit different. We, as Christians, proclaiming a Messiah who has come, they, in Judaism, believing the Messiah had not yet come, made that somewhat incompatible. So eventually, the worship of the early church shifted from Saturday to Sunday. And there was obviously overlap, and this took years. They would worship uh, on the Sabbath day and worship also on Sunday. Some say that Sunday became the day of Christian worship because it was the day of the Lord's resurrection. Some say because it was the first day of creation. Some say it had to do with the increasing amounts of Jewish converts to Christianity and the need to shake off the Jewish customs. Whatever the reasons, what we know is that the day of Christian worship shifted early in the history of the church to what would become called the Lord's Day, Sunday. And this practice of weekly corporate worship which is the pattern set forth in Scripture, the pattern of the Old Testament, the pattern of the New Testament, the pattern uh, followed by Jesus, the pattern of Jesus' disciples, the pattern of the first century church remains the pattern for the majority of churches, Christian churches today. So that, in a nutshell, is the answer to the question, where does this concept an expectation for weekly worship come from. In other words, it's not some legalistic thing that I'm imposing on you. It's not some idea of man that churches got together and said, this is how we ought to do it. It is the word of God. And that is why I can answer with, uh, the, that question every Sunday with a confident uh, yes. Yes, if you are able, because believers belong in weekly worship. God deserves your presence in weekly worship. No one here, I think, would argue with that. Doesn't God deserve our presence in weekly worship? And our brothers and sisters need us, need the encouragement we bring in weekly worship. To skip church, to attend church sporadically, to not want to be uh, tied to a weekly regular commitment. I know that's normal today. And, and a lot of my colleagues are saying there's nothing we can do about it. And I jump up and down on Romans 12 too and say, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. I don't care if that's normal. You don't hear me weighing in on other trends. I don't care if jeans are skinny or not. <laughs> I don't care if you can see through them in their slits all through them. I don't care if they're bell bottoms. I don't care if chamois shirts are in. I don't care about that stuff. But I care about the church. There are trends out there that don't deserve our time and attention. That get This one deserves our time and attention. Our text for this morning lets us know that ours is not the first generation to fall into a routine of church skipping. It was the habit of some in the early church, we read who forsake the assembling of themselves together. But notice what they are told. Hebrews 10, verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. All the more as you see the day approaching. Don't do that. Don't stop gathering for worship. Why does the writer of Hebrews give us this instruction? A cynical person might say, well, because he doesn't want the weekly offerings to suffer. Be you know, because the church, after all, just wants your money. That's what the church is about. And then another might say, because the church just wants to tell you what to do. Because that's what churches are all about. Churches just want to control you. But in context, there is a much more well-intentioned reason for this command. The writer of this letter wants to see to it, listen, he wants to see to it that those who begin with Jesus finish with Jesus. What he wants. Theologian John Gill wrote, It is the duty of saints to assemble together for public worship. On the account of God, who has appointed it, who approves of it, and whose glory is concerned in it. And on the account of the saints themselves, that they may be delighted, refreshed, comforted, instructed edified and perfected, and on account of others that they may be convinced, converted, and brought to the knowledge and faith of Christ, and in imitation of the primitive saints. And an assembling together ought not to be forsaken, for it is a forsaking God and their own mercies, and such are like to be forsaken of God. Nor is it known what is lost hereby, 
and it is the first outward visible step to apostasy and often issues in it. Forsaking worship, which had become the custom of some in that early church and is the custom of many today, is serious business because it is the first outward step toward apostasy. Apostasy is the abandonment or the renunciation of the faith. Abandoning the faith is something that the writer of Hebrews uh, wants his readers to be aware of and not do. Th this author pleads with, with us, with believers, to be careful, to pay attention to what has been taught, to pay attention to what has been heard, to not drift away, to not become like those who shrink back, to not abandon what is right. And he sees it as a matter of life and death. He goes on to write this, if we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more do you, severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God under who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, who has insulted the spirit of grace. There is a danger in beginning with Jesus and not finishing with Jesus. There is a danger, a false assurance, that everything is fine when it's not. Jesus himself said no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. How many people today call themselves Christians, identify as Christians, because of a profession of faith that they made at some point in their life. Maybe they made it long, long time ago, second grade, third grade, at VBS or a, or a, 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 a camp or something like that. Made a profession of faith that long ago, identify themselves as Christians, and that has been followed by a life that is devoid of worship and has been lived completely to the self. How many call themselves Christians but neglect the teaching of Christ's word? How many call themselves Christians but view as optional the following of Jesus' commands? This type of thinking is totally incompatible with what the scripture tells us it means to be a disciple, a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. It is tantamount to the, to the scariest testimony I have ever received in my life uh, of a woman who had lost her father and asked me to do the funeral. And so I, I did not know this man. And I said, tell me, was he a believer? And this is what she told me. She said, he was a believer, not a follower. I have never heard a more condemning testimony in my life because to be a believer and not a follower puts one in the direct company of the demons of hell. The devil himself believes and does not follow. Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my command. You love me. Which leads me to think that when we struggle to obey a command, and we do, and we will, because even though we are saved, there remains this, this old man, this flesh that wars against the Spirit of God, right? So we understand what it means to struggle to keep a command, but when we struggle to keep a command, it's telling us something about what we really love. We struggle to make it to worship regularly. We can't seem to do that when the scriptural pattern is weekly worship and the word tells us not to forsake that worship. What or who is it that we really love? We may say it is God, friends, but our actions are saying something different. Have we fallen for what C.S. Lewis his endlessly recurrent temptation to go down to the sea, and he has in parentheses, I think St. John of the Cross called God the sea, to go down to the sea and there neither dive nor swim nor float, but only dabble. 
How important is your faith? Is God a priority or is he just one among many? Again, C.S. Lewis provides us with a challenging insight. When he says Christianity is either incredibly important or it's not important at all, one thing it can't be is somewhat important. Amen? It's either all important or it's not important at all. So how important is your faith and the practice of your faith to you really, honestly, I want to propose in closing this morning that what we need in our churches today to address the issue of sporadic attendance is not Christians who follow the rules dutifully and go to worship every week, as much as you might think that's what I'm, I'm shooting for. That's not. What we need, brothers and sisters, is Christians whose hearts are once again filled with the awe and the wonder of the word become flesh of Christ come down from heaven to save us, to give his life for us that we might have eternal life. What is needed is a deep, deep love of Jesus. I fear that many of us were coached and coaxed to receive Jesus, just to receive him into our hearts. And it comes very natural to all of us to call upon Jesus and to use Jesus. But we would all do well to consider what it is Jesus. I believe that with a true love for Jesus that is rooted in a heartfelt understanding of his amazing love for us, which he proved by his suffering and by his death, the issue of worship and coming to church is resolved. Too many Christians today are looking at their calendar of events and they are asking, do we have time for church this week? Can we fit it in? But when we really love Jesus and when our lives are lived in response to what he has done for us, our thoughts toward worship will change. You don't need a better attitude toward worship today, I don't think. You need a better attitude toward Jesus if the Spirit's convicting you. Our our thoughts will change. We will no longer ask, do I have to go? I mean, I've got to confess, I asked that a lot when I was a kid. But I didn't know the depth of the love of Jesus. So we will change from asking, do I have to go or should I go to I can't wait to go. You know, beloved, it's, it's not that we have to worship, it's that we get to worship. We get to worship by God's mercy and grace. Further, when we love Jesus, we will love what Jesus loves. And for sure, Jesus loves the church. Enough to give himself up for it. Do you? Will you? Will you make Jesus your priority? Will you make Jesus the thing that is regarded as more important than another? Do that. Any concern you might have about worship, come into church. I'm going to take care of it. Stand and sing together our concluding hymn last week week I invited you to survey the cross and this week we're going to sing it 324 hymnals better use a hymnal before we sing this let me just say there are certain days in in ministry that you know God is trying to do something because nothing goes right truly when, when, when your schedule is messed up, when, when things happen that are out of the ordinary, when you have uh, technological uh, glitches and cell phones are firing off all over the place, what God is trying to do something. 
And, and so now we have proof. The question is, what is he up to? And figuring that out belongs to you. But I want to invite you this morning as we close to, to gather again at the cross and gaze on that cross and know, know, know in your heart what Jesus has done for you. You will worship him. Let's worship him in song.